fun if he's here With some not so nice advice for your writing career To be clear, no punches will be pulled But the punch may be spiked How they like before they get on the mic To my left we got the mighty Mer Lafferty And if I piss her off, believe me, she'll come after me And her co-host met Evan Wallace On the right, yes, she may be half as hype But she can take him in a fight So settle in, folks, buckle in and boot up Time to meddle in a way to make your writer shut up It's hard work, but the perk is that it's fun and exciting Facebook will still be there when you're done writing Ditch Diggers! Coming to you live from Morgan Freeman's iPhone 7 Bluetooth headphone store, it is the Ditch Diggers with Mer Lafferty and Matt Wallace. How are you, Matt? I'm great, Mer, except I'm apparently the last person on the fucking planet who didn't realize that the iPhone 7 doesn't have a headphone jack. Yeah. So, I'm dealing with that. That's I actually... Because I've been doing, I've been recording with you with my phone. I've been using the Skype app on my phone for the last few sessions. And I went and I got a, I got a new iPhone 7. We upgraded because our phones were old and, and falling apart. And we got a deal on the iPhone 7. I'm like, I don't really give a shit, whatever. So I, literally five minutes ago, I go to plug my headphone jack into my brand new, huge, ridiculously gargantuan iPhone 7 to discover there's no phone jack. And I look like a monkey trying to do calculus. <laughs> Apparently this was huge news and I missed it. I'm not cool. I, I admit it. I'm not on the cutting edge of things, but I'm still kind of pissed off about it, to be honest with you. I'm still um, pissed off about it in anticipation because I, I don't like the idea. And when I upgrade, um, I believe Android's going to be going that, uh, most Android phones are going to be going that way too. So eventually Bluetooth headphones will be where it's at, which means and I guess, so and I much it, more shit yeah. to lose. That's the thing, and I asked before we began recording. I was I was yelling at Mur about this. Not that there's anything she could do about it, but I was asking why repeatedly. And the reason is because Bluetooth. Bluetooth is the why. It didn't even occur to me at the time because again, I'm not on the cutting edge. They're like, it's time to do away with analog and wires and all that old and all that old shit. And uh, and I guess that makes sense. But I like my I like my head I like my earbuds. I like my headphones. And I'm just sad about it, Mur. I just feel, I feel like the world, it's one of those moments where you feel like the world is passing you by, you yeah. know? Yeah. Like your time has come and gone. They're going to, you know, give you a Bible and a shotgun and send you out in the wasteland to bring law to the lawless in your last days, a la Judge Dredd. And I'm not, it just, it makes me sad. So That sounds pretty cool, actually. And actually, as I was saying it, because I was going to go with the, like, the ice flow, old people on the ice flow thing, but that's a myth, and I didn't want to perpetuate it. And then I thought Judge Dredd. But then as I was saying it, I was like, damn, can I, I wish we could actually do that. I would totally do that. Yeah. And I guess it wasn't, did I say Bible? I I, think I said Bible. I think you did too, but I was cool with that. (laughs) It was, no, it was a law book in Judge Dredd. It's not the Bible. Um... I mean, I guess it's kind of a metaphor. It doesn't matter. I'm not, we're not here, Mer, we're not here to dissect uh, the metaphors and subtext of Judge Dredd. We're not here to do that. Not this week, anyway. Not this week. We'll get to that. Every podcast has to have an episode where they dissect the subtext of Judge Dredd. This is not that episode. Right. This is an episode where we're going to get to the main topic in a moment, but uh, you had some words to offer on a relevant uh, subject to all our professional and aspiring to be professional writers out there. And I, I would like to hear about that. Oh, good. Well, the funny thing is, is that it, it doesn't sound relevant, but I think it is. So um, I'm going to tell you a couple of, <laughs> shut up. I'm going to tell you a couple of, couple of anecdotes, and then I'm going to tell you how they're connected. Please do. There was a uh, study done tracking how many, uh, uh, how much time people used on their apps on their phone or their tablet, and how they felt afterwards. And it turns out that all the apps that make you feel like shit are the ones that you spend the most time on. Facebook, Candy Crush, um, a lot of social media stuff, a lot of the games. It's just like you don't feel happy or fulfilled afterwards. You get, your, your brain gets the little dopamine hit, but you know, that's, that doesn't last. And the apps that make people happy are like the meditation apps, the reading apps. 
as the hounds wail in the background. I know, I know. As if, as if to underscore what you're talking about. Yeah, the neighbor's having work done on our house, so uh, the new dog feels the need to alert the world. Let me let me close the door. Hang on. Wailing of hounds, I say. We should probably edit this part. Sorry, what'd you say? I said, leave. let's leave the wailing of hounds underscore thing that I said, but let's edit out the part where you close the door just so we don't seem like absolute amateurs. <laughs> okay. Cameron Hurley already accuses us of never editing. She does? Yeah. Oh, that's cold. I mean, she Come was on, talking Karen. about... She listens to the podcast ardently, and she was pimping it on Twitter, but she did, yeah. She was like, I think... She said, I think when they talk about editing, it's a running gag because they do not edit these shows. Well, Cameron, oh, we edit. You do take that all personally now. I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> I just assumed. I, just I assumed got a lot. note on a notepad here <laughs> that says 12 minutes, which means that when I get look at this raw audio and I go to part 12 minutes, I'm going to cut that part out. I told and I told her on Twitter, like if she only knew the work that you put into cleaning up this madness. So, but more the point is, she listens to every episode of the podcast, and she was talking about it on Twitter to her audience. We love so. you, Cameron. We really yes, do. Absolutely. But anyway, so apps. Apps. The apps that make people happy are like uh, Kindle for reading, Audible again for listening. Um, I think the podcast app was in there. Um, we can put a link to it in the show notes. The meditation apps. But those apps are like very small percentage of your day. Right. So so that that, that little nugget kind of lodged in my head. And then this past weekend, I um, there was a, a, a virtual race in Zombies Run, which is the running app that I like. And they do virtual races sometimes where uh, you listen to the story and you run 5K and then it logs you against everybody else in the world who's running the same story, the same 5K. And since it was a Halloween race and Halloween was coming up, I realized I needed to get out and get moving. So I went out to run and, um, you know, I didn't want to. I was fussy the whole time. I was grumpy. <laughs> And then later on that day, I had to do some writing for a deadline. And then later on, I had, uh, I'll just say, a, a, an, a social situation that made me uncomfortable going into it. It was meeting new people, etc. And then during the social situation, when it was almost over, I just, you know, kind of took, you know, took inventory of how I was doing. Right. And I felt good. I felt really, really good. And that's a twist. Yeah, I felt good that I had done all of those things. And that's when the epiphany hit me. Happiness is work. Ah. It's, it's like the, the, the things that we do, you know, that we think makes us happy because it gives us a little dopamine hit, like checking Twitter, checking Facebook, looking at email, all those things. Computer games, I'll admit it, those kinds of things. Those make us think we're happy. They make us think we're relaxing, but it's dopamine's not happiness. You you actually have to work to be happy. Because it's like I can waste so much fucking time on Twitter and then I think, you know what? Meditation's good for your brain. Countless studies have said so. Perhaps I should meditate. Oh no, I don't know if I want to cut out ten minutes to do that. <laughs> and that's like ten minutes. While I just blew half an hour fucking around on Twitter. And you gotta use the goddamn Twitter, but you gotta know when to stop using the goddamn Twitter. And so, and, and a lot of people think, how do I find time to, um, to write or whatever? Yeah, and I know this one. is more of a, a beginner question than a ditch digger question, but sometimes ditch diggers have this problem. And really, it's like, you gotta remember that, that, Writing is work, and happiness is work, and, you know, a lot of people don't want to write, they want to have written, but that means that writing will, eventually, after writing, you will have written, and therefore will be happier. I'm not saying writing is a automatic, happy path. I'm just saying that, that that's the kind of thing that makes me happy, 
and it takes work and I have to reassess how I look at things right now because I still think that lounging around on the couch and playing computer games and hanging out with my family passively is fun, but I don't feel fulfilled afterwards. Right. No, I think you were... You're talking about the opposite. You're talking about the the hard path to to happiness, not the not the easy immediate gratification things. And writing definitely falls into the former category, I would say. Because yeah. Because it's a hard yeah. It's hard to get to the end of I have written. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's absolutely true. And I I I was talking. To, I think I was talking a little bit about this on. Uh, I do a daily blog now, Mer. Did I say that yet? You did not say it. You've told me and Twitter, but you have not told our people because uh, we have not mentioned the fact that we missed a couple of weeks because you got fucking married, and I did not mention that. So congratulations, dude. Thank you, thank you. We're kind of we're kind of doing the beginning in the middle here, but whatever. I had a, yeah, I had a very I had a big few weeks. We moved into a home. We moved into a new home. I got married, and I started a new daily blog channel on youtube and i started a new wrestling channel and i'm starting a new, a new newsletter i'm doing a lot of things but and I, I can show all that later in the in the episode what i was saying is i was talking about this a little last week i was talking about how because you were t- you were saying like twitter versus meditation why do you perceive one as work where the other is this kind of instant gratification easy thing that you do naturally you know and i was talking a lot about last week about how um Silence is difficult for us as people. And uh, isolation and silence are difficult because you're kind of forced to deal with yourself in those moments. You're forced to deal with yourself honest. I said that in the silence, we confront honesty. That's, that's the thing. That's the smart thing that I said. And that's the truth. And I think, I think the stuff that is ultimately more fulfilling, like the meditation stuff, that's more introspective stuff. That's more uh, isolated and not filled with noise it's difficult for us because we kind of, if, if, even if we're not aware of it, we fear that shit. We fear, we fear being alone in that and what we're going to think and what we're going to find out about ourselves and actually seeing the world the way it is. Because the world doesn't make any sense. We just we pretend it does every day to kind of get through with what we need to get through. So I think those things are harder, even though they are ultimately more fulfilling uh, for that reason. But I think they're absolutely worth doing. You know, that was the other yeah. part I wanted to is you should seek the silence, you know, and I, I think a lot of what you're talking about involves that characteristic. Yeah, and and I forgot another one of my epiphanies. Um, sure. It was the Zombies Run thing. I was looking at my stats in Zombies Run, and I, if you ask me to, to name my favorite apps, it would be in the top five, and it's one of the ones that I have a yearly subscription to. I pay a fee every year, so I get all the premium content because I love this app so much. I've, I've supported the, the Kickstarter. I love the concept. The execution was perfect. It got me running. Um, I would say it's one of my favorite apps, and right. then I looked at how many times I've used it this year, and I won't tell you because I'm ashamed, but the number was not large. <laughs> right. So this thing that I would say makes me happy, gets me moving, I don't use. I feel like we're still so close to being uh, apes that, you know, you've got the, <laughs> like, you, you, you've you got to push a heavy weight to get a bigger, to get a big reward, or pick up a tiny weight to get a tiny reward right now people are gonna go for the tiny weight because like oh look look reward right now yay and it's gonna take some work to get me past that and i i even did it today it's like i did my daily podcast for my the patrons which by the way if you support our patreon you will get the daily nanowrimo podcast that i'm putting out every day daily every day redundancy is awesome so after i'd done that my goal was to write until i talk to you and i've been on twitter the whole time it's like it's 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 a it's a mud pit that you get sucked down into, and then you think, "Fuck, man, I'm in mud. What am I doing in mud?" And then Although you're still. Can be exfoliating, so there is. Well, that. sure, it can be exfoliating, and Twitter can be fun, and Twitter's good for your uh, communicating with your readers. It, it's it's got a use, and it is fun, but specifically, it was not doing that then. No, and, I, and, the, and what got us onto this as it relates to, I mean, you're talking about writing, but I think a lot of a lot of writers we know are having a particular problem with this stuff this year in particular, um, kind of coping 
with the uh, with productivity versus the mental junk food, you know? Yeah. Be- because of the news. And the news is and the news is another thing. Like Twitter is an extension of that these days. Cuz my Twitter is every day. It's like it's like 60/40 you know, news and people reacting to the shitty news and being angry about the shitty news and exposing the truth of the shitty news. And then, like, the the rest is the fun, cool stuff that you used to enjoy, you know, like 100% on Twitter. Yeah. So we're all kind of, we're all dealing with that. It's sort of like, it's, it's, it's very much like, uh, you know, the whole CNN and wartime thing. Like, in the 90s, that was, that was a big thing. Like, people just glued to CNN during mm-hmm. Desert Storm or during the Iraqi war. <clears throat> Even Wolf though we're not... are under the table, I remember that. Yeah, no, it's old school, <laughs> but it is. It's you just you get you get this kind of umbilical cord thing going where it, it's pre it preoccupies so much of your time and so much of your thoughts. You're worried about missing anything. You're, you're worried that you're going to look away from Twitter and like the nukes are going to drop and you're not going to know it. You know, like literally, it's it's gotten to be that kind of fear. Um. So yeah, and I, and I, and I think uh, freelancers and creative people in particular have an issue with that because so much of our so much of our schedules are self-imposed. That's that's the thing. A lot of that, that's something that uh, that's actually a point I would like to make that I don't I don't think we made before is people look at um, you know writers or freelance artists who are freelance creators in general talking about how hard it is to do their work and create this year, and they think and I think some people tend to have that ad, that attitude that reaction of Oh, you fucking whiny, flighty, bullshit artist. Just, you know, get out of your feelings and do your job. And it's not about that so much as it is we don't have structured careers the way most people who go into a day job have structured careers. When yeah. we talk about writing, you know, you know, you know, you have to get up at seven o'clock every Not you, Mer, I'm talking about someone who has sure. their, their main careers. And a lot of writers have day jobs. And that's another part of this dealing with their day job on top of dealing with writing. But I'm just talking about the writing part right now. If you have a day job, you know, I have to get up at seven. I have to be in the office by eight. I have to be there till five. And in that span of time, I have to get this, this, and this done, or I'm going to get fired and I'm not going to have any money anymore. Like, you know, those things. When you're a writer, you don't have that. I have to get up here. I have to do this, this, and this before this hour because then I go home. Your schedule is entirely self made and self imposed, except for, you know, deadlines that before and after that deadline. The people who pay you don't really give a shit what you do or how you do it as long as the work is delivered by that one specific time period. So right. Because we make our own schedules and our own uh, and our own structure, um, it's it's more difficult when you've got all this shit uh, pulling at you in every direction. You know, every time you look at your fucking phone or turn on the TV or something, and it's it's a genuinely it's a genuine issue that that uh, I think freelance creators are dealing with. This year in particular with everything going on, it's been tough. And I and I, I give credence to that. And people who don't really understand that should give credence to it, too. It's a real thing. Nobody's trying to fuck off. Nobody's trying to slack off or use it as an excuse. We're really trying to get our shit done here and make money and, and do what we need to do. It's just with the way that uh, our, our profession is structured, it's more difficult under these circumstances. That's all it is. Yeah. Yep, exactly. The... Um... I think, I can't remember who said it, it was a little while ago, but somebody was talking about how we're, I mean, not that we've evolved to accept television or the internet in our lives anyway, because it's too new, but, you know, we we still, most of us grew up with the idea of you get the news at six o'clock, unless, right. six o'clock at night or in with, on in the morning paper, you don't. And, you know, if the president gets shot, then you get a special report, but that's when you get the news. And now it's, it's all day. It's, here's what happens, and now everyone reacts to it. And you have to see how everyone reacts to it, and you have to hear everyone's (laughs) opinion. And if, you know, if, if they... If they mirror your opinion, which probably most of the people you follow on social media do, it's going to fan the flames of, yeah, outrage. And if they disagree with you, then that's going to fan it even higher. Just like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And yeah. it's like, that is not a way to have a healthy mindset when you're definitely trying to bust your ass and, and be a freelancer. 
or any job really but if you allow yourself to see the news all day every day which is unless you're very very careful i believe cameron hurley actually does this with many many very pointed uh mute words on yeah. in her in she's, what she uses to to read twitter she's, with she's big on the mute words which is smart yeah unless you you know curate very carefully then when you go on social media you're gonna see that and uh, if you want to use social media as a tool for your career, which, you know, we endorse, which we've said, y- you got to figure out how to deal with that. When it's not going to make you happy, it's going to make you really fucking stressed out about something that probably has nothing to do with your job. Or if it does, like the ACA is is tangentially, tang- I can never say that word, slightly connected to your job. Can you say More that word? Slightly. Tangentially? Yeah, you can. Good for you. Sorry. Um, yeah, to bring it back around to your original point, um, there's nothing you can do about the news, but what you can control is the the media and the apps and the things you're voluntarily ingesting on a daily basis. And Amur, I think you make a very good point about things that actually make us happy versus uh, things that we're kind of imbibing as uh, mental and psychological and emotional junk food. Yeah. So basically what we're telling everybody is less Twitter, more meditation. Yeah. That's the that's the watch phrase for today on Ditch Diggers. Less Twitter, more meditation. Some Twitter, use Twitter, build your platform as an author. You need to. No one's going to do it for you. Uh, but less Twitter, more meditation. You know, it's, it's a tool. It's a tool just like your keyboard is your tool. If you use your keyboard for so many hours a day as, as, as a writer, you know, constantly typing... You're going to get injured. You're going to get repetitive stress injury. Carpal and tunnel. That's what? right. I'm raising the roof, man. Okay. <laughs> Except you can't because you got carpal tunnel and your hands hurt. Well, no, that was the thing. It's like my I've got the limp hands. My wrists are really, my elbows and my shoulders are doing the work because I can't oh, do anything. Oh, see, I can't see that. See, I've always thought raising the roof should be the international symbol for carpal tunnel because it's like I can't use my hands. And mm-hmm. I'm not making light. I'm being serious. Like... I've I, I have my both my hands are pretty arthritic, so I have complete sympathy. But yeah. that's my thing. If you want to draw attention, if you want to raise awareness, to raise awareness for carpal tunnel, you got to raise the roof. That's the other watch phrase for ditch diggers this week. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't know where I come up with this shit either, folks. So anyway, um, keyboard is so a tool. Gonna... You could hurt yourself if you use it too much. Keyboard is a, tool, a tool. Twitter's a tool. Our yeah. president is a tool. All that uh, good stuff. Yeah. Um, so I think we I think we've I think we've covered that well and we can move on. Yeah. And what are we moving on to, Mer? You segue. You well, carry, carry the burden of segue. This is the thing show. that that has been uh you know, this is the thing that's been on my mind for the past couple of days, and I would like to segue onto what has been on your mind for the past couple of days, which was a really eloquent Twitter rant you went on the other night when you were using the tool of Twitter. And well, that has to do with this one. coming weekend, know. which is World Fantasy Con. Right. No, I don't know how eloquent it was, but I did get off on a rant. It was a controlled rant. I don't rant as angrily as I used to, I don't think. No, I think but I I'm think more... you're more articulate, and so you make better points. Yeah. I'm more measured and more articulate now. I'm more rational. Um, no, uh, What? Here's here's what happened. I saw tweets lamenting the fact that World Fantasy Convention is this weekend, at which they hold the World Fantasy Awards, which are one of the bigger awards in the in the genre, which I think is a fair statement. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, and, and, but I saw a bunch of tweets lamenting the fact that they hold the award ceremony on Sunday of the convention, and yes. that's messed up because a lot of people have to go home. They have to leave the convention and go home on Sunday or earlier. And they either miss the award ceremony or they don't have time to enjoy it or they don't have time to celebrate. And the kind of gist was, wouldn't it be, be- wouldn't it be nice if World Fantasy would end that tradition and move the award ceremony like Saturday so more people could enjoy it? And that is an entirely and – and the thing I made clear on Twitter was it's an entirely fair point. I'm not – giving shit to people who are tweeting that. I'm not giving shit to people who are thinking that. I agree with the point. The thing that really struck me when I read that is it just displays this reoccurring theme that I see with with writers and people in publishing of like not acknowledging a core problem, just kind of dealing with and accepting the ramifications of the problem as they are. And the problem in this instance is 
the reason people have to leave on Sunday is because they have to be back to their day jobs on Monday, the day jobs they have to have because despite being nominated for one of the biggest awards in their industry, they cannot afford to support themselves writing that that content that they were that they were nominated for. That's also, the reason. Also point out that um, World Fantasy is one of the most expensive conventions. Actually, it might be the most expensive convention that genre writers have. Um, RT is also, but that's, and RT does welcome science fiction, like urban fantasy types. Um, they're, they're a lot more open to science fiction and fantasy, but, uh, still, I know a lot more people who go to Worldcon and World Fantasy Con, and World Fantasy Con is extraordinarily expensive compared to other conventions. And if you want to attend the awards, I believe you have to pay for the banquet. It's it's a it's like an award show at a banquet, so right. you've got to that's extra. So you got to pay to travel, you got to pay for an expensive <laughs> thing, and then you pay for the banquet and for a plate, basically. You're yeah. paying a plate fee. Yeah. You you may be able to attend and not eat, um, but I'm not sure. I'm gonna actually look that up and you vamp for a bit. I'm, I don't need because actually, that what, what I wanted what I wanted to ask you is, you had some really great points about how we are up in arms about how, you know, expensive these are and how they don't seem to take the author into account when they schedule the awards ceremonies, which is for the author and um and illustrators, but. You're saying what we need to be angry about, where we need to focus this anger is toward publishing itself. But what I wanted to ask you is, how do we do that? Well, yeah, I, I need to kind of finish rounding out the point first. Oh, well, go ahead. I'm going to look that up. I will do that, Murr, no problem. And I did actually point out that, that you know, speaking to the people who have to leave the con early, that's no say nothing of the people who can't come to the con at all because they can't afford it. Oh, yeah. Which is which is completely standard. It's It's a very standard typical situation for an author to be nominated for a major award in their field and they can't afford to go pick up the fucking award that they've won uh, despite being acknowledged as one of the best writers in that field because they write in that field and they don't make enough money from it. So my point was, you know, and the, and the thing with the awards in general is we spend so much time, especially in, in genre, on these, on these various awards, the Hugos, the Nebulas, the Locus Awards, the World Fantasy Awards, we spend so much time and energy and effort and we form committees and there's all this political stuff that goes on and we have business meetings and we just so much energy and effort of the field and all the people in it are focused on these awards and not on business matters of publishing, which are much more prevalent. And that's that's what I was talking about. And I, and I said the reason for that is because Awards are something we can control. That's why we spend so much time on them. There's something we can control that gives an air of importance and gravitas to the field and that gives us something to elevate ourselves with that we can actually control. Writers as a group, and genre writers in particular, um, we have no collective bargaining power in the publishing industry. We just don't. We have some guilds, we have some associations, and they try very hard, and I'm not, and, and the other thing I wanted to point out is, this is not a rant about me bagging on any particular guild or association. They try, they really try. I think especially now, in particular, with the state of the industry and the way it's going, they're trying really hard to, to put a bandage on some of this stuff, but the fact is, they have no power to negotiate with like an Amazon. They have no power to negotiate with major publishers, especially as they continue to consolidate into these increasingly huge conglomerates. Nobody gives a fuck what um, a science fiction guild has to say to them, and that's and that's really the issue. And the, the problem is authors are at the bottom of an increasingly diluted revenue stream. That's where we end up finding ourselves, is we end up getting fed from the trough uh, last when, when it comes to the sales of our books. Advances notwithstanding, but even then, you know, there, there are huge problems with that with that structure as well. And that was the thing that I wanted, I, that was the thing I thought we should be focusing on more. As I said, I would like to see half the effort that we put into the politics and upkeeping of all these awards put into increasing uh, 
not increasing, but bettering working conditions and pay structures for writers. That's what I would like to see, because there are huge problems with how the funds in this in this business are distributed, on several fronts. Did you find the thing you were looking for, Mer? I did. It doesn't look like the banquet is optional. So you you go and you have to purchase tickets for the banquet on top of everything else in order to attend the awards. That's fucked up. I'll just say it. That's a fucked up thing to make people do. I know it's hard to put one of these things on. I know it costs money. But, I mean, no one's saying you have to have a banquet either. I just... Whatever. That's not the point. Again, this is not the point. The fucking award ceremony is not the point. Or the cost of it. My point on Twitter was... The point should be that we should be able to have an award ceremony on a fucking Wednesday afternoon, and it wouldn't matter because authors would have time and money to attend. They would not, They would have money from the books that they sell, and they would have time because they won't have to have day jobs to supplement their income. That's what we should be going for. Right. Not let's make the banquet cheaper so broke-ass authors can attend it. Let's keep the banquet and pay authors more money. That's, that's the point I was trying to get to. Now, the how, and I acknowledge this entirely on Twitter. This is not, it's not an easy problem. It's not me saying if we would just stop focusing on awards for a year and focus on this stuff, everything would be immediately fixed. This is a long-standing, deeply entrenched, deeply broken, really only getting worse system, and there, there's no easy solution uh, to it. But one of, the, but a few of the things from my perspective, and I want to, and Mar, I know you have opinions on this too, and I want to hear your thoughts on getting writers more money. But and this was some of the stuff I was putting on Twitter was we need to be focusing on things like ebook royalty rates, which there's a huge disparity in what authors are are getting from their ebook royalty rates from major publishers and what major publishers are willing to part with on that front. And the big thing to me, and I don't, and this is where it gets really, it's get, it gets really touchy for a lot of people in publishing is, I really feel that the process of major or traditional publishing or whatever you want to call it needs to be streamlined. I feel like on the publisher's end, they carry a lot of dead weight that is very costly that prevents authors from generating more revenue from that process because it's going to support a lot, a lot of dead weight in the publisher side of the process. Part of that is not keeping up with current technology. Another part of that is, and this kind of relates to a question we got on Twitter that we're going to answer later, but fuck it, I'll do it right now, is a lot of the staff that they, that they employ. And, and, that's, and it gets in a sticky area because I, you're starting to talk about people's jobs. And I know people who do these jobs, <clears throat> and I'm not blanket saying all of them suck at it. When you look at a lot of publicity and marketing departments in, in publishing, they just are playing very ineffectual a lot of the time. They, they simply are. They're not keeping up with uh, current digital marketing trends. They're not helping authors sell their books as much as they are. And it just, it galls me sometimes. Some publishers I've worked with, and I've heard this from other people who don't want to say it publicly, is I'm, it really sickens me that I'm dealing with a publicity person who makes a full-time salary and is getting paid way more than I am as an author and they're not really helping me sell this book or anyone yeah. else. That know. It's just the truth. It's the, it's just the truth. And that's, it's a hard thing to say. And I'm not knocking anyone in particular, but it's a problem in this industry. You take uh, a publicity department, you look at the overhead that that's costing you and what you're carrying there for what you're actually getting for the value for your money. That's a budgetary area that can be completely restructured. And that's just, it's, and again, that's just one of many things, but those are just, those are a couple of things I was talking about on Twitter yesterday. Mara, I would like to hear your opinion. I've been talking for a very long time. Um, my opinion on which part? All of it. I don't know. Um, the whole mess, Mara. Yeah, the, the whole, whole mess. mess. The thing is, is that uh, I think the problem is when we complain about the awards, the the people we would need to focus on in order to fix them is smaller by several you know magnitudes than publishing as a whole well well, yeah obviously that's why we focus on the awards thing i'm just saying so it's it's a lot it's it's going to be a lot more work and it's a lot wider net that we have to throw out and we also have the problem of um you know, it's the whole scab thing. There are people who will work for shit, who will give uh, 
you know, take yeah. horrible advances or no advances in order for the, the thrill of just being published. No, yeah, and absolutely. then, um, you know, I, I, I don't talk about money a lot, but I will say uh, uh, vaguely that my first two books, The Shambling Guides, did not sell the way my publisher wanted them to. So when it came time for them to buy Six Wakes, they offered me a lot less money. Right. And I didn't have any bargaining power, so I accepted it, and uh, I just found out that it earned out in the first six months. Mm -hmm. And if they had given me what I'd earned for the first two books, well, one of those books, then I would have come, like, within a thousand dollars of earning out. Right. So, it's like, it, it, it's it's... It's just unbelievable. It feels like those advances are arbitrary. It feels like um they're completely arbitrary. Yeah. I absolutely and I and I heard a lot from this from a lot of people on Twitter yesterday when I was talking about this is I was offered a contract that wasn't taking into account the sales that I've had. You know, like one thing didn't match the other. And I, yeah. I heard that from several people on Twitter yesterday, which is definitely another problem with it. Yeah. But there's always there's always somebody who'll take a lesser advance, like you were saying. Yeah. So it's it's not um Yeah, it I I don't I wouldn't know where to go, which is why I was asking you. It's it's a great idea, but where do we start? Um I think you we have to go back to uh Tobias Buckel's thing and be willing to say no. Be willing to say no to a shitty deal. Be prepared to have a backup plan. Be prepared to tell your agent, no, that's not what I want. Or be prepared to self-publish. Um, it's, it's, that's the good thing about the fact that we have so many options now is because you can say no. Yeah, you absolutely can. Indie authors, and I heard from, again, I heard from a lot of indie authors yesterday when I was talking about this. We talked about things I was tweeting about, that's why they made the choice to kind of go on their own and go indie because they could make more money selling fewer fewer books. And it's not an easy thing to do. Selling any book under any context is not an easy thing to do just because of the glut and the culture. But there are a lot of authors having very decent, moderate, and even large successes um, in an independent setting. And that is that is something to consider. Mm -hmm. But I just the thing that the thing that galls me about that is that's a viable alternative, and I, I think it should become more prevalent. And I'm all for I'm all for cutting out the middleman eventually, anyway. But dealing with the system that we have now in place, like it doesn't it doesn't need to be the way it is. You shouldn't have to go indie just because um, you can't make any money in traditional publishing. It shouldn't be that way. And that sounds very pie in the sky and very optimistic and very like vague but it's the truth i just these things have been structured over decades uh to be the way they are and people just kind of blindly accept them um i i completely agree one of the big things is authors need to be willing to say no but the really what you get to at the end of the day is you have to get enough authors together willing to say no and you know that's when you start talking about um sort of that unionizing thing and it's and that's and that's where it usually falls apart right there because when it comes to freelance creators and you know I was when I was a professional wrestler we had the same problem you know wrestlers don't have a union uh, professional wrestlers are all freelance contractors and it's very hard to get uh, people who are who operate on such an independent basis and have such independent personalities on the same page for something like collective bargaining with with a publisher and also the other thing that fucks you up there is you have. You also have to start at the top with that. You need to go after the, the authors who have more stroke. And a lot of them just have no vested interest in, in screwing with their money you know, or biting the hand that feeds them. Sure. And that, that's where this argument, when you really take it to, to the place it needs to go, that's where it starts to break down, is when you start to talk about actually unionizing authors and achieving some kind of collective bargaining power. Is It's hard to get authors on the same page. No, no shitty pun intended. It's yeah. hard to get them on the same page to begin with, and even if you can do that, even if you consolidate, uh, I was going to say midlist authors, even though midlist is, I don't even think it's really a thing anymore. Um, you can consolidate smaller authors. It's hard, It's even harder to try to bring the bigger authors in on it. And that's what, honestly, I think really needs to happen to, to, to affect change in the traditional publishing structure as we know it. 
Yeah. So, and I don't, and the thing is, I don't know what the answer to that is. Like, I, like, you can say what needs to happen, how to execute it is, is a whole other thing. But it is, it is possible, man. It's not, and it doesn't need to be a revolution. It doesn't need to be, you know, we storm the buildings and take them over and have a list of demands. It just needs to be, you know, start with doubling the ebook royalty rates. Like, I, most of my book sales right now, with traditional publishing, are ebook sales. And my sales are not phenomenal by any means, uh, but if if you doubled what I was seeing from the from those ebook royalty rates, it would make a difference. And and it doesn't because publishers make so much money off of ebooks that they don't they don't want to share the lion's share of that of those profits. That's a huge. That's just one huge problem in and of itself. I would like to start with things like that. I think that's. I think those are attainable goals. Yeah. But uh, yeah. But yeah, it's just tough. But I think we just need to change our thinking as as writers. And the the original point that I was trying to make is, you look at a situation like World Fantasy Con and you uh, uh, and the ceremony being held on Sunday, and you say, well, we need to change the con schedule. When the real problem is, we need to change the circumstances that don't allow authors to attend an award ceremony on Sunday. We just we 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 accept things as they are so much it doesn't even occur to us to address that problem. We just address the symptom. And that, at very base level, that's the thing we need to change immediately, is our thinking and how we approach uh, the business, new writers coming up especially, and like Murr, like you said, that willingness to say no. It's really just about changing your thinking. I think that's where it begins. Where it ends is a whole other thing, but like we have to actually, we have to find a start before we can get to the middle and the end. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I don't know if I was as eloquent here as I was on Twitter, but those are those are those are things that we were thinking that, and it's just it's hard, man. It's hard for me to watch books uptrend, and more books get sold, and authors make the same or less money. You know, it's just it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's a it's a distribution of wealth problem. It's not a selling books problem. It just isn't. That's the thing that nobody really wants to acknowledge. You know, because it's it's just hard. It's hard to accept that. You know, more books are being sold. I don't want to make any fucking money. But it's the truth. So there you go. Um, we are coming up on 50 minutes here about. Should we get to questions for her? Is there anything else you'd like to say on this subject? No, I don't think so. Sorry if I kind of steamrolled that. I, I get I get very passionate. You get a lot of passion with the, with the yelling at the publishers. I get a lot of passion with yelling at the publishers and, the, and and you know just to just to underscore this um i work with a major publisher i i love the people who work at the publisher like without exception i really do they're amazing people who work in publishing i'm not in any way saying publishers are evil i'm saying the corporate structure is deeply flawed and i know publishers who do their best to function within that system and help their authors as much as they can my publisher did that. They gave they they let me write my entire series of books um, when the when the sales didn't necessarily support going that far with them because they wanted to give the series a chance to find its audience, which is a rare enough thing in publishing to begin with. So there are really good people in publishing. I'm not saying pu traditional publishing people are evil. I'm just saying the corporate structure that they are given is a deeply flawed one. That's all. Oh yeah, no, I'm with you. Yeah. Um. We actually have a, a good amount. I think people missed us more. I think they did too. I missed yeah, us. I missed us too. We're pretty awesome. So I want to start with, uh, so we're going to Twitter questions now. I want to start with a question I referenced earlier. It's from our, it's from our good friend, Michael R. Underwood, Mike Underwood, author, works in book marketing. Um, one of the good ones. Uh, Mike asks, thoughts on the reports of agents asking authors to submit marketing plans during the query process? And I'm going to repeat that, Mur, because I feel it bears repeating. Yep, it does. Thoughts on the reports of agents asking authors to submit marketing plans during the query process. Oh, I have thoughts, but I'd like to hear yours, Mur. I have, I have many thoughts. The fun, the the. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is, are you fucking kidding me? The second thing that comes to mind is hearing, like, I've heard, you know, as you, if you follow agents online and read their blogs and read their Twitters, you, you begin to hear the same things over and over again. I don't care if your mom liked your book. I don't care if your kid liked your book. I don't need to see 
five pages of your life story. If I ask you for 50 pages, send me 50 pages. Don't send me the whole book. You hear this over and over again. And, and, and so you, you, you begin to learn a little bit about what agents want. And one thing I've heard time and again is don't tell me, I mean, tell me where it would fall. Tell me what books it's like, but don't tell me that it's going to be a bestseller in this or it's going to basically don't market the book before it's sold and right. don't think that you're a marketer. I've heard this this many times. Like like people are thinking ahead to all sorts of stuff when they don't even have an agent to help them sell the book in the first place. And so I was shocked when I heard that agents are asking for this. What's really funny is is first I just thought it was publishers and I thought, well, you know, I had to fill out like an eight page questionnaire on one of my books that kind of pissed me off, but I replied a lot of things with, I don't know, I'm not a marketing professional. Right. And, um, so, but, but, you know, doing a double take and really like, it's agents asking for that. I don't, I don't even fucking know what, what, and, and, and people already, we, we've established this new authors often don't know the ins and outs of publishing, even with the internet at their fingertips, a lot of new authors don't know the ins and outs. So why would you expect them to know how marketing works within publishing? It is such bullshit. Yeah, it's so, there are so many flavors and levels of absurd to this proposition. Like, I don't even fucking know where to start. Like you said, it's like, it's like asking somebody who makes shit out of Legos to like draw up detailed blueprints for a fucking skyscraper in Manhattan, you know? They may be exceptionally talented at building things, but that doesn't qualify them to uh, to draw up detailed plans in a medium they have nothing to do with. You mm -hmm. know, it's it's just asking. Them, so that's like that's the that's the first thing. The first thing right there is new authors should not be dried up marketing. Plan. New authors should learn about marketing as they go. Like that's an important thing. You're going to have to know this stuff. But it's completely ridiculous and unreasonable and unwise to to ask for a marketing plan from a burgeoning author. Who most of them that I know are lucky if they just figure out how to query an agent and do it in a respectful, proper way. You know, yeah. like you're at the beginning, you're a fucking zygote. Like what, what even? And even here's the thing. So there's that. Even if you're a fucking master of marketing, even if you like graduated with a marketing degree and you worked in marketing for 15 fucking years and then you decide to become an author, that's great. That'll give you an edge. It'll give you input. It's not your fucking job. Yeah. Right? I'm just going to say that. it's not, it's not supposed to be, it's become our jobs. It's become our jobs. Every publisher seems to expect you to go out on your fucking own and sell the book. That is not our jobs. Again, and I was talking about this earlier, publishers employ entire departments and full-time employees whose jobs it actually fucking is to do this or is supposed to be. And it's just completely unreasonable to keep that on an author. And that's the publisher doing it. Then you get to an agent. It's not an agent's job either. I can only guess an agent wants it so they can present it to a publisher. Like, I, I, I can't even understand the motivation. First of all, I don't know why, what the motivation is to ask this. Like, my agent asks uh, people querying him to just list, like, their comps, like, their comparable titles. So he knows where to put their book. And that's mm -hmm. it. That's all he wants to hear. And then he just wants to hear about the book. That's... And that is perfectly reasonable. I think smart. It's good for context. But a fucking marketing plan has no place in this process this early on. It just shows you how just glutted and clueless this fucking industry is when it comes to selling books. And I can't and, – and just no. No. That's the thing. I'm gonna, I, I, don't wanna, I don't even want to see the other side. Fucking no. It's not a thing that I think anybody should be asked to do when querying an agent. Submit a fucking marketing plan. It's ridiculous. The closest um... – you would need it just for the record is if you are proposing a nonfiction book, you need to list your credentials. And if you know of any, if you do any like public speaking or know of any professional organizations at attached to whatever you're working with, they might need to know that. But that's like the closest I can think of for <sighs> submitting marketing information. Yeah, but again, yeah, that's but that's just that's information. That's not a, that. There's a very there's a very big difference between you should buy my book about this because I did X, Y, and Z, 
and I know the field, and here's a detailed fucking marketing plan for my book. It's, a, it's apples and oranges. Yeah. Um, I'm not getting on you. That's a perfectly reason, rational and reasonable thing to offer up on this topic. I just, it really, it just gets to me, man. It gets under my skin. The, the, I don't I don't like the way so much of this business is trending and has been trending for years. It just really, really pisses me off. And so, yeah, Mike, that's how – those are our thoughts on agents asking for marketing plans. We are against it. Who just managed to finish their first fucking novel. Um in case you didn't question. get it, Mike, we yeah. are against it. We are we are against it. Yes, I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. We have a question that is about uh, rewriting and editing, and it's it's a straight up craft question. I got to start cracking down on these, Mer. And I don't. I, if you disagree, you can tell me because we haven't talked about this beforehand. But I just feel like this isn't the forum. I want to keep this about business writing education, and I know we we play around with those topics sometimes. But just straight up questions about getting writing your thing and getting it done. I really feel those are more uh, I should be writing type questions than digital questions. I agree, but for for one little comment is that on I should be writing, they're not going to get your take on it. That is true, and and I'm very sorry about that. But I just feel like we need to stick to business questions on on digital. I, I just I feel like I need to start harder because I've been lax before and it's been on my mind. And, like, sometimes I'll do it when we don't have other questions, but we have business questions to get to this time, and I don't want to spend podcast time on questions that aren't business questions when we have business questions. Is that fair? Sure. Okay. So I'm going to skip that one. Um, TJ Berry asks, my writer friends talk about filing quarterly taxes. I've just started making money writing. Do I have to file quarterly now? No. uh, I am not an accountant. I'll say, but um, it, it, I guess it just depends on how much. Uh, I think I, I I can't tell you where I cross the line. I just remember we use an accountant, and after one bit of taxes one year, she's like, it's time for you to start filing quarterly. Yeah. But, you know, it wasn't like the first year I made a $900, I got a $900 check. You know, no, it, was, yeah. it was well after that so if you're just starting making money um and it's not a lot then uh i would say don't worry about it however i will say if you're making money and you're doing deductions and you're going to be having multiple streams of income you might want to consider getting an accountant and you can file with them and then they can tell you when to start filing quarterly yeah and i mean you should I just always get an always get an accountant would be my get get a good accountant in this life you need a good accountant no everything you just said Murray you know uh, at this point that uh, T J Barry is at I, I it's not a it's not a thing yet especially if it's I if it's supplemental or secondary or whatever else you might be doing but yeah get get a and again we're not accountants so you want to get an accountant double check this on in your specific situation T J Barry I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about it too much yet. Uh, what else do we got? Oh, I thought we had one more. I guess I was wrong. Okay, you know what? I'll do the I'll do the editing and rewriting question, and that's what we'll end on. But in the future, I'm gonna be cracking down. I'm gonna be cracking down on the craft questions. This is a business. This is a writing business podcast. God damn it! I'm being tell facetious. Them. I'm being facetious. I, I just. Know. But, I, but seriously, I, w- I would really like questions that we address to focus on the business of the writing. I appreciate it. People want my perspective on craft. Feel free to ask me questions on Twitter, Matt F, at, at Matt F and Wallace. If you, want, if you have a craft question you want to ask me, just ask me on Twitter. I'll answer it for you. It's fine. So um, Kevin Cavallaro asks, how much editing and rewriting is too much editing and rewriting? How do you know when you're done? Uh, I mean, that's... <laughs> yeah, See? we're... we're now you're, yeah, you were on the fence before, I could tell. You're like, I don't know if I want to go with Matt on this whole cracking down on the questions thing. I think he's hardlining. Now that I've asked the question, you're regretting it, aren't you? No, I'm not regretting it. It's just, it's one of those, what does strawberry taste like? You know? <laughs> I can't it, tell it, you it what t- strawberry t- tastes like. It tastes like strawberry. It tastes I, like strawberry. You're done when you're done. No. Yeah. I I will say that um, I'm struggling with a specific thing right now, which is um, my 
I started a novel and I didn't like where it was going, so I started it again. And then other projects came up, and this is a novel on spec that I'm working on, so I put that aside. And now I've decided to work on it for NaNoWriMo, so I've restarted it for a third time, and I'm starting to feel like I'm thinking about it a bit too much. Right. And I know that that I'm I'm starting to get mired down in like this this pit of webbing of of how many metaphors can I mix in here about just being absolutely stagnant. So for me, I'd say three times starting a novel is plenty and I should not start again. I should it, I should continue one of the three that I have. But that's not quite what you're asking, but you got if there's a question like this, it's one of those things where you have to to learn yourself. You have to learn what works for you. What works for me may not work for you. Some people write incredibly clean first drafts. They consider their first draft the shit they wrote yesterday, they're going to look at today and tweak it and then keep writing. And that's how they make their, that. and then they deliver their final draft when they're done. That's how some people consider drafting. And other people will go through drafts and drafts and drafts. And um, on I Should Be Writing, I just interviewed Grant Faulkner from NaNoWriMo, and he was saying how one of the, uh, uh, I can't remember who it was, but there's an author who uses NaNoWriMo to start her novels, and she ends up throwing out about 90% of the novel once it gets published. It's like she takes she takes what she writes for NaNoWriMo and she edits and edits and rewrites and adds to it so much that she thinks she has about 10% of her original words left. So it, it's like, you have to learn what works for you. Yeah, I mean, I tend to edit as I go, which freaks a lot of people out, but I'll, I'll write a scene, uh, rewrite a scene several different times before I move on in my first draft. And that takes you a little longer to finish, but I tend to have much cleaner first drafts the because thing is, of it. We don't, since we are talking about craft, we don't recommend that for beginners because no. beginners will sit on that treadmill all day. I knew somebody who worked on the first page of his novel for weeks, yeah, weeks no, and weeks, point, the, hours every night. The point, the point that I'm illustrating is I can't, that's why I don't want to answer the question. Right. Because <laughs> it's a shitty answer for somebody who's just starting out. Um, I, like if I had to give you a boilerplate thing, I would say do your first. I, I I always emphasize to new writers, especially, that the most important thing with your first draft is just getting the fucking thing done. Like I honestly feel like if you're just starting out, the most important thing is to have that first draft finished. Um, that doesn't mean you know don't take care of time writing it, but it means just don't obsess over it. Don't obsess over any one part too much. When you haven't finished ever finished a novel, finishing that first one. I think is is one of the most important things, and then beyond that, I would you know I wouldn't I wouldn't go more than one or two passes on it before I started letting people read it, and that's just especially for your first one because it's gonna suck probably probably gonna suck odds are very good it's gonna suck. You may be one of those people who writes a first novel and it's fucking brilliant it's amazing that does happen odds are very good your first book is gonna suck. What's gonna help you suck less is when other people read it and tell you why it sucks. So you're really, with the first one, I think, you're just trying to get the best sucky version to people so they can tell you how much it sucks. That's, those are my honest thoughts on that. And this is why I didn't want to answer craft, craft questions. But, you know, <laughs> whatever. All right. We do have a cup. We have a, a interesting question um, that came I up. Overhype. Huh? I wouldn't overhype it. I wouldn't overhype it. Uh, you don't know how this is going to work out. Overhype what? Oh, what is interesting? I can <laughs> yeah. have my own goddamn opinion, asshole. I don't care what you think. That's good, too. So we have a question via email from Aaron. Okay. I'm surprised at the strength of your don't drink and write comments when the topic comes up. I'm definitely not trying to glorify it, but I've got a day job and a family life to work around, so my writing time and my relaxation time often overlap. If I had to stop writing every time I cracked open a beer, I'd lose half my opportunities to get work done. Again, I'm not arguing booze is in any way constructive, just wondering if it's necessarily destructive. And um, I, I think this is a great question, because I, I drink, and you drink, and we've drunk on the podcast. Um, I think there's a big difference between the alcoholism of Hemingway and Poe and how people romanticize those lifestyles and yeah. 
having a couple of drinks now and then, or even every night. But, um, and if you enjoy having a drink, getting relaxed and writing, that's, that's, that's fine. That's not, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the people whose lives were destroyed by alcoholism. And yet we don't, we, we use that as a mark of the glamorous is the wrong word, but sort of the, 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 the wild, romanticism, the romanticism, the, the, romanticism yeah. of the wild writer's life. Like people would throw Gatsby parties when the movie came out. It's like, did you not fucking pay any attention to the story at all? <laughs> I mean, yes, it's not fun to dress up like the other people from the time, but there's a message there, and it's not that those parties are good. Yeah, that's kind of, yeah. So, it, it's like, I... I don't think anybody reads the book anymore. It's a problem. Yeah. So, when I... Personally, when I have a glass of wine, I am going to want to be relaxing. I don't get a glass of wine and, and get to work, but that, that's how I live my life. But if you want to have a beer and sit down and relax and write your words, go on with your bad self. Yeah, I don't give a shit if you want to drink it right. It's just like you said, it, it, that was about busting the myth that drugs and alcohol somehow make your writing better or brilliant or something to me. Because that's what went on for a long time. Was a lot of people think, well, I need to open up my mind to new yeah. things. I need to get loaded so I can. It's, it's bullshit. It doesn't make, it doesn't make your writing better. It's no, there's yeah. no magical formula. It's not like, you know, two thimbles of rum and like a line of Coke and bam, <laughs> you hit that, you hit that sweet spot where you suddenly become much better than you actually are. Yeah. So that, that's all, that's all it was about. It was just, it was that longstanding myth that writing, uh, while you're, while you do a bunch of drugs or drink a bunch of stuff is going to somehow make your writing better. Cause it's not, but absolutely have a beer and, and write. We don't care. Yeah. Cool. Do we have any more? Any more email questions? I don't think so. Um, I'm sorry, my e my email box is full because I started giving away books on. Um, I should be writing Free books. Yeah, I started giving away the authors I was interviewing, and you know, next time we interview somebody on Ditch Diggers, if I have their book, uh, we should <laughs> in, we should give away their book. What? No, you just said uh, you said you're giving away the authors you interview, and I just had a really funny visual in my head of you like actually crating the authors that you <laughs> interview and shipping them to readers. So yes. you know, it's like an um, author in a box in your living room, just banging on, like "Let me out of here, Mur!" And you just whack it with your cane. I don't know why you have a cane. Sure, in my I head, can you. have a cane. It's probably a cane sword. I think that's what it is. Yeah. In my head, you have a cane sword. You just seem like the sort. I'm looking at my books right now because actually I think I was sent one of Neil's most recent books. Well, he writes a lot of them. Why is this relevant? I just Because I was thinking I could give it away. Oh, like for, for this show? Impromptu yeah. giveaway? Yeah. Cool. Who are we going to give it to? Well, they have to email me. Oh, okay. So if you email, if they email you, they can get a free book. Yeah. What do but they, they have, have to say? You? They have to say, um, you know, give away ditch diggers in the subject line because now that I'm giving away books on I should be writing and ditch diggers, I got to keep them separate. But um, I, I don't want to make it an a uh, 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 definite thing. But you know, if you want to spread the word about ditch diggers. And then email me. I would, it would be appreciated. And um, it's not a signed Neil Gaiman book, but it is a a shiny new. And I believe it's a uh, shit. Is it Stardust or Neverwhere? I'm doing a very bad job of this. Perhaps I should make a note of this and give it away next time. Possibly. Even if it is an autographed, I hear that Neil Gaiman actually goes to the warehouse and licks every copy of his books before they're sent out. That's true. He does. So. But what I'm thinking is when. Um, your series is complete. We need to give away a couple of stacks. Right. What do you think? No, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm down for that all day. If I, I, I will get stacks and we will give them away. They'll be fat stacks, Mer. That's I know. How stack, that's, that's kind of stacks that uh, I don't know what I'm doing. But yeah, Seven let's, fucking let's books, man. absolutely do that. I, and I'll lick everyone for you, too, if you want. Excellent. That's, that's on request. 
Copy book licked on request by Matt Wallace. How about that? That sounds good. I like it. I like it. Well, so you show you your Mark? stuff. I'm going to tell um, Twitter about you licking your books. Okay. So thank you all for listening. Uh, if you want to catch me online and ask me a craft question and not send it to the podcast, you can find me on Twitter at Matt F. N. Wallace. You can find my website at Matt-Wallace.com. I am doing a new daily vlog. I do it every single day except for the weekends. So really every weekday. But uh, I'm doing it on YouTube. The channel is Angry Writer. Um, I'm also doing some fun unboxing videos and some other stuff. We're having a good time over on my Angry Writer YouTube channel. Come check it out. Come subscribe, like, comment, tell your friends. Um, I'm also doing a wrestling channel called The Riot Tapes if you're a wrestling fan because because again, I used to be a wrestler. I like wrestling. Uh, if you want to come subscribe to that, I'm doing a, I'm doing wrestling themed unboxings on that channel, a bunch of other stuff. My new book, Gluttony Bay, comes out next week as we record this, November seventh. It's the penultimate book in the Sinajura series and my epic Sinajura saga. The final book comes out next year, so this is this is the one that ramps up to the finale, folks. Gluttony Bay. It's actually my personal favorite in the series um, of all of them that I've written, and I've written the final book too. That includes the final book. Uh, so yeah, please do pick that up, pre-order, uh, paperback, ebook, whatever you do. Uh, my other novella, Rencor, Life in Grudge City, my Lucha Libre, Luchador, Buddy Cop, Supernatural Comedy novella is also out. <coughs> please go get that as well. Um, and I believe that is all the shilling that I'm fit to shill, Mer. All right. Well, uh, you can find the blog and show notes that Matt's going to write so eloquently um, at merverse.com. You can find my stuff also at merverse.com. You can find my latest science fiction book, which is called Six Wakes. You can find my I Should Be Writing book based on the podcast, which Barnes & Noble just listed as one of the top... Let's see, 13 books that offer a master's class in science fiction and fantasy, including uh, I Should Be Writing, uh, one of Chuck Wendig's writing books, On Writing by Stephen King, um, yeah. one of Ursula K. Le Guin's books. Yeah, it was, Run, it was a big dog. super exciting to get that. Raising the, raising okay. The <laughs> With your sad little arthritic hands, That's don't, little don't push too hard. Yeah, so those books are available now. And um, if you like free science fiction, you can go to escapepod.org. Our 600th episode is launching this week. We, we, it's very exciting. We got a Connie Willis story for you. She's one of my favorite authors ever, and she's a grandmaster of science fiction, so it's a lot of fun. Crap, what else? Patreon! Patreon! Yes. We have a Patreon. It is at patreon.com slash mightymer. It's got my name, but Matt does take a cut of it, so if you want to support both of us, give money there. I am doing a daily NaNoWriMo-focused uh, podcast just for the Patreon supporters. It um, Each one is based on a... Each day is based on something you might hear on the radio. And my other podcast, I Should Be Writing, it's about the craft. It's focused at beginners. There are a lot of interviews, and that's also at merverse.com. I've probably forgotten Groovy. something, but we've gone long, uh, gone on long enough. So hopefully, now that uh, Matt's life has slowed down a little bit, we can get back on a regular schedule and see you in two weeks. So yeah, let's end the show. That's in the show. Anyway, merverse.com is where you can find most of that stuff that you can't find at Matt's website. Uh, oh, and I'm Mighty Mer on Twitter when I'm there, which I shouldn't be there on a regular basis because of previously said happiness stuff. So You should be we'll meditating. Yeah, I know. We'll I see should that be next meditating. Time. No. <laughs> Puns! You wanna I know have a, them. If you want to know a secret, I hate those jokes. I hate them. Just got to say do. it. It's oh no, I'm telling the listeners. Do oh, you, yeah. you, you people love making them and I got to say that it's a very good catchy title for the podcast, but sometimes I regret it because lord do people say it a lot to me. A lot. It's the price price of fame, or price of your unending and yielding wealth-filled fame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll end it at that. You can support us at patreon.com slash mighty mer. Ditch diggers! Theme song by Devo Spice. DevoSpice.com.